reading today is from the prophet Habakkuk, or Habakkuk, however you were taught to pronounce it. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 5, 12 and 13, and then 12 verse 1. This is from Habakkuk. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe even if I told you. <clears throat> are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are, pure, ha, you who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? And then verse, chapter 2, verse 1. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to Christ. Thank you all. Those of you looking on and listening in uh, are really blessed by a team of terrific leaders and servants. Thank you, Bill, Beth, Stephanie, Eric, Joseph, Nathan, Brian. Uh, this, this particular sermon series may make you wish you had one of those Bibles with tabs in it so you could easily find Habakkuk or Habakkuk. Beth asked me earlier how to say it, and I should know. I can read it in the Hebrew, but I, I think it's okay to pronounce it either way. And you know the Bible's a long book, and I don't know how well you know it. Um, I am impressed occasionally, um, often, there are folks in the church that uh, did not go to seminary and yet have studied the scriptures and know them well. There's a point in the sermon later that uh, was taught to me most effectively by a friend who simply studies the Bible, uh, not simply, who studies the Bible with care uh, amongst friends. And I wonder how well you can know the whole book, right? So I think initially I'm like, there's no way we can actually be gripped by and understand something about every one of the books of the Bible because there's too many of them. And then I'm like, but maybe I have more than 66 friends and I can tell you things about them. I definitely can describe in way more detail than you would like the plots and action points and props in over this many, over 66 films. Uh, how many episodes of Lost, Friends, Hallmark movies have you watched? Can you remember that many golf shots? All that to say, perhaps we can continue studying the scriptures and hear what God says about himself. That's why we go to the scriptures and to hear what he says about us. Because if he exists, then what he says about himself is more true than what we think or feel about him. And if he exists, what he says about us is more true, more descriptive, more accurate than what we think or feel or read elsewhere. First Timothy says that all scripture is breathed out by God and valuable to us. And then in 2 Peter, he says this about prophecy. So Habakkuk is a prophet, though different. Many of the prophets are... There's a lot of kinds of prophecy. Let's just say that. 1 Peter chapter... 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 through 21 says this, And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention. As to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. With that knowledge, we turn to Habakkuk, perhaps longing to know by description what prophecy is. Sometimes I hear uh, people describe them, their own gift of prophecy 
and they describe it very narrowly. And then when they actually speak words of prophecy, you could drive a bus through the application of them. Um, I mean, they're just so wide and broad. I think we get a better definition by going to the prophets themselves and learning as they teach us what prophecy is. One unique thing about Habakkuk is that he, is not, he was not given words to say to the nation of Judah. By the time that he writes this, this is probably about 10 or 15 years before uh, the Babylonians who God talks about in chapter 1. Beth didn't read that, but I'll read it in just a moment. Probably 10 or 15 years before the Babylonians uh, besiege, take over, and then eventually exile most of the nation of Israel. A horrific uh, season for the nation of Israel. Habakkuk complains. I love this. I, I think sometimes with the Psalms, we want to give extra language because their honesty can make us nervous. But with prophecy, because we know prophecy matters, like we know what to call it. So in your Bible, there's a little heading above it. That's not, there are no Hebrew words there, but to help us follow along, it says Habakkuk's complaint. <laughs> We're not using overly religious language here to describe this. So perhaps uh, after church today, you can tell someone that you learned that you have the gift of prophecy because you sometimes complain. That'd be fun, right? You could indirectly teach them about Habakkuk. Maybe not. I don't know. Those, these jokes always seem funny to me in the middle of the week. And then they, I mean, there's no one in the room, so how will I know if it's funny or not? And in this way, Habakkuk reminds me of Jonah. I mean, I, I continue to be, to, to find Jonah funnier and funnier. Among other reasons, because who wrote Jonah? I mean, the man wrote a four-chapter book about how mean, disobedient, sinful, and ultimately judgmental and racist he is. And he did that because he believes in the goodness of God. Habakkuk does not sin throughout the book of Habakkuk that we know of, like Jonah did. I mean, Jonah sins in every chapter of that. He literally does the opposite of what God tells him more than once. Anyway, but Habakkuk uh, complains, How long, O Lord, shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence, as in I see violence everywhere, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. This is a very personal prophecy. And yet, when Habakkuk is complaining, it's not selfish. There's a time and a place for us to talk with God about our own situation. There's also, it's also important, follower of Jesus, that you complain about the violence and injustice that you see in the world, and you do so to God, expecting him to hear you and to receive that. We get the impression here that this is not the first time that Habakkuk has cried out, How long? Do you say how long in your prayers? And you're like, this is not as fun as I thought an Advent series would be. We've got all these colors and presents and lights and trees. But Advent, as Beth reflected on in her prayer, is about waiting. Because even though Jesus has come in the flesh, he has not returned. Proof is everywhere. <laughs> He's not here yet. Do you pray how long? Do you ask God how many times you're going to have to repeat how long? Do you ask God if he really sees how bad it is? Don't let your theology get in the way of praying with honesty, complaining with honesty. In the, uh, the, the 9 o'clock service, which we're not able to have this year because of uh, space constraints and because we agreed to follow the government's uh, restrictions, we pray out loud, and it's usually a group of about 30 or so, and, and a handful of people will pray out loud. And one of the most faithful prayers I've ever heard in our 9 o'clock service was, God, I do not see you in this. I, it was years ago. I found it an incredibly biblically faithful way to pray. And now we notice something, too, if we're paying attention. 
Habakkuk is going to immediately place on us, or he's going to immediately show us one of the burdens of faith that any of you with an active faith and prayer life have experienced if you've been a Christian more than six months. One of the challenges of the with, with God life, one of the challenges of faith, and especially of living by faith, is God's silence. For a time, he has been silent. And that's challenging, isn't it? Whether your prayers are about your own story or what you see around you, his silence is challenging. We don't like, we don't like silence, right? How's your screen time looking? I mean, if you look at your screen time, you'll learn how much you do not like silence. We like quiet, <laughs> but we like quiet so that we can do things. And I spent perhaps too much time thinking about silence generally because this is not quiet. I moved that off, Eric, but you can just come back to me. This is not quiet like the peaceful reflective quiet. This is not silence like the spiritual discipline of silence, which I kind of want to talk about, but that's not what Habakkuk is talking about. This is relational silence. This is quiet when an answer has been requested or even demanded, begged for, and it's been a season of it. You know, when Paul talked about, or when Paul asked the Lord to take away the thorn in his flesh, I don't know if you're familiar with that in the New Testament. He says, I asked the Lord three times. But he means time, or the word time is season. This is the thing that Sheila Cooley explained to me as best anyone I've ever heard. It's a season, probably an extended season. And the Lord did answer him. And the Lord is going to answer Habakkuk. But we must pause for a second and recognize that God is sometimes silent with our big questions about the world and our questions that are, have a little bit more to do with our story, unpacking it and healing it. And, and part of the... I was about to say something trite. Go away. Trite statements. God's silence is a challenge and will continue to be a challenge until he returns or we go to be with him. But then he answers. And I'm going to read the whole text of his answer. Beth read chapter 5, and the reason that it's in quotes is this is now the Lord speaking. So the oracle of Habakkuk is about his complaints and God's answer. And by the way, the <laughs> oracle can also mean burden. I think there's a lot there. Anyway. Picking up in verse 5 of chapter 1. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. This is the Babylonians. It's another name for them. That bitter and hasty nation <laughs> who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. Habakkuk's complaining about violence. God says, I'm going to meet violence with violence. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. One of the challenges of the with God life is when God is silent. But another challenge is when he answers. This is the double burden of the conversation with God and to God. This is a silence and his answers. This is why Jonah disobeyed so much. He did not like, he liked the prophecy life in Israel. He did not like being sent out, and he really didn't like what God told him to say. 
Habakkuk does not like this answer either. For Job, the answer of God was incredibly challenging. For the Israelites, God spoke to them. It was challenging. For the Pharisees, when God told them how the actual state of their hearts in Matthew 23, the answers of God to our questions, both asked and unasked, in this case asked, very challenging. God is going to use the Babylonians. He's actually, God is actually uh, <laughs> preempting Habakkuk's second complaint a little bit by saying he is both going to use the Babylonians to judge the nation of Judah, and then they will be judged. About 40 years after the exile, they will be taken over also. Sometimes, and this is part of our understanding of suffering in the world and God, Sometimes, God uses evil to further his own strange purposes. Use the word strange to describe God sometimes. So this is a, a quote by N.T. Wright that I'm going to read, and I want to say first, you can start reading it if you want to, but I want to say first, li listen. For at least the next hundred years, there will not be a conversation about the Apostle Paul without referencing N.T. Wright. He is a terrific writer. I think the preeminent theologian of this era. He writes great small books that are really accessible. His longer books, I'm not as big of a fan of. But listen, probably the preeminent New Testament theologian in the world. And will be talked about for a long time. Listen then to what he says. Because I think, well, I think we have something to learn from this. Somehow, strangely, and to us even annoyingly, the Creator God will not simply abolish evil from this world. The question that swirls around in these discussions is, why not? We are not given an answer. We are instead informed in no uncertain terms that God will contain evil, that He will restrain it, and that He will prevent it from doing its worst and that he will, even on occasion, use the malice of human beings to further his own strange purposes. And I love that he uses the word strange because this preeminent New Testament historian, who's probably going to write a hundred more books before he dies, that's how why, and he has a lot of help doing it, but that's how wildly productive he is. He uses the word strange because he's humble, especially about evil. So God's silence and his answers, because we do get an answer in Habakkuk, but that answer is perplexing, isn't it? And yet it's so worshipful of Habakkuk. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die, which is both a, a statement multiple times in the Old Testament and a way of encapsulating the covenant that Israel has, has with God. This is a way of reflecting on it for Habakkuk. And it's so intimate. My God, my Holy One, using the personal name of God. O oh Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O oh Lord, have established them for reproof. So Habakkuk understands, but he doesn't like it. So he describes God's decision this way. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You make mankind like the fish of the sea. Habakkuk is saying, God, you're treating us like fish. That's what it seems like to me. Habakkuk is saying that. Like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out of his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. And by them, he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? This is how Habakkuk feels about God respo God's response. Doubt has a role in your faith, as does complaint. And doubt and complaint are not merely intellectual things. They are things we experience because we are embodied creatures in the world. Habakkuk is livid at God. And if you never have been I don't understand. And if you haven't yet expressed that lividness to him, you're missing out on some of the beautiful 
relationally intimate aspects of the with God life. Now, if Habakkuk were sitting in here, he's like, don't, like, we're talking about the Babylonians. Yes. And in your shouting at God and telling him that he treats us like we're fish, you're also speaking to him with great intimacy. This kind of honesty is very intimate. At the same time, Habakkuk is not praying selfishly. This is not about him. I wonder if we were to complain honestly, what the, if we were to complain honestly and someone was listening, what picture would they get of God? I wonder if, if they had no concept prior to listening to our prayer, if they would think that we think God's sort of like Santa or a slot machine or is mercurial Zeus. Is he kind of like an anemic principle of a school? Or is he the God of the universe who we can pray to with full honesty about the injustice and violence around us? Especially when his answers bother us as much as, if not more than, his silence. I invite you to read this book along with me. Um, by Riyadh Kasis, a Syrian theologian. If you have Kindle Unlimited, it's free. A um, couple of reasons. One, it's excellent. It's an excellent book. Two, it's really short. And I love short books because I feel like a productive human. When I turn the page on Amazon and I go from 30% to 31%, I'm like, yes! I'm joking about something that is not, it's not a funny book. This is a Syrian theologian talking about Habakkuk. But hear what he says. Some Christians have formed the idea that Christianity and the Christian life are furnished with flowers and tranquility. When faced with difficulties and tragedies, they start wondering about the strength and validity of their faith. And it benefits them in such circumstances to express to God in all honesty and transparency how they feel. Whether it is a question, a complaint, disappointment, doubt, or feelings of despair, it would benefit them to learn from Habakkuk that God wants them to share all they think of or feel, whether they consider that stemming from faith, little faith, or even lack of faith. The name of the book is Frustrated with God. And it probably doesn't seem like an Advent book, but it is. It may not be a Christmassy book. It may not celebrate the winter solstice. But it's a very Adventy book. I invite you to read it with me over the next few weeks. Habakkuk experienced God's silence. He experienced God's answer. He's going to receive another answer, which is why I said answers. And both of those perplexed him, and they perplex us. But what's his statement? After his complaint, I will take my stand at my watch post, chapter 2, verse 1, and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk is modeling the with God life. We watch. And for a Christian, watching is not a passive activity. It's a constant sense of anticipation about what God is going to do in our lives and in the world. Watching involves honest prayer and honest paying attention. And it's such a statement of trust. And this is where preaching the gospel is so interesting. It's an honor, and it's so interesting. Because I wonder if you see how quickly and dramatically this text applies to your living room. If we trust God the way that Habakkuk does and interact with God the way that Habakkuk does, and then listen to God the way that Habakkuk does, we're freed into our relationships, into our work. We don't go to our work asking it to define and identify it. Like we, uh, we don't identify ourselves by our work. We identify ourselves as first a child of God in an intimate relationship with him. If you're married, we don't go to our spouse asking them to make us feel a certain way, because they actually can't. I can unpack that for you if you want. But especially if your first love and allegiance is both given to and practiced with God. Suddenly we're free. 
when our children misbehave, we're better able to care for them and discipline them because the goal is, first, that they trust us, then that the relationship that's violated when they sin is restored, then behavior change. This kind of trust in God and this kind of modeling that Habakkuk gives might seem like a stretch to you, but I don't think it is. Yes, Habakkuk is not here so that we can become better parents, but the trusting faith that he models does teach us implicitly and indirectly. It leads us, if you will, into such a dynamic trusting relationship with God that suddenly our disproportionate emotion with our neighbors goes away. Usually not quickly, but it goes away. And we're free to love them, to choose to love them. The life of faith is intimate allegiance, honest conversation. And then we watch, which is anything but passive for a follower of Jesus. I chose Habakkuk because 2020, oh man, I don't even know what to say (laughs) about it. But perhaps alongside this year, we can go back to a text that is about waiting and conversation with God, and we can be encouraged because God does not silence Habakkuk. God does not reject his complaints. God receives them, even condones them by continuing to respond. We learn from that, and by his grace are grown up as lovers of him and neighbor. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we praise you for inspiring the words of Habakkuk in Habakkuk and ask that we would learn from him how to relate with you and to you. Jesus, we praise you for becoming flesh. And I ask that every time we see a present or a flower arrangement or Christmas lights, we would remember that you became flesh and that it would speak peace to our hearts. Holy Spirit, we are challenged by our doubts, by our religiousness, which distracts us from this kind of prayer and intimacy with you. And we ask that you grow us up in the joy that you purchased for us. Amen.